So let's go ahead now and take the elements, the building blocks, um, that is, of every, all the stuff that we see around us, and see how we can put these elements together to make compounds. So the two main uh, features um, to look at when we are taking elements and making compounds out of them are the way they join together. So I'll just introduce these terms here. So bonding refers to the way the elements are joined. And once they are joined, they could be arranged in special ways. So structure is a look at how the atoms are arranged in a compound once they have been joined together. So as we go along here looking at um, putting elements together to form compounds, these are the two main ideas that we'll, we will be looking at. We'll be looking at their bonding and we'll be looking at their structure. Now for bonding there are three, three different ways that um, the elements can be joined together and the way I like to structure this is uh, by taking a look at the periodic table to start with. So I mentioned briefly that anything above this staircase is a non-metal, anything below this staircase is a non-metal and the metals have properties in common, for example, they are good conductors of electricity, good conductors of heat, whereas the non-metals are generally poor conductors of heat um, and they don't conduct electricity well at all. So we can categorize these types of bonding into the three types, where the first type is a bonding between a metal and a non-metal. And there's a name for that. The name we give this sort of bonding is an ionic bonding. And then you have bonding between metal and metal. We call that a metallic bonding appropriately. And then the third possibility is a bonding between a non-metal and a non-metal. So that takes care of all three possibilities if we were to categorize the bondings based on interaction between metals and non-metals. And for this final type of bonding, we call that the covalent bonding. So in this video, uh, I like in particular to look at the ionic bonding. Now it's a good thing that elements tend to want to bond to form new compounds. Otherwise we wouldn't have the variety of things that we see around us. But why do atoms tend to want to bond with each other? Well, I would hinted at this fact um, in previous videos. We said that atoms tend to want to have a full shell of electrons. So let's take a look, for example, at sodium. Sodium is element number 11. So my periodic table tells me sodium is element number 11. So we will not worry about the mass number for the moment because we are interested in the electrons. So sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. So it has an electronic configuration of 2, 8, comma 1. So remember the first shell can hold two electrons, second shell maximum of eight electrons that leaves one electron left over for um, the valence shell. And indeed sodium is in group one. So we, we, we could have um, known what how many electrons there are in the valence shell just by looking at a group number and indeed it does have one electron in the valence shell. Now in order to get a full shell there are two things that it can do. It can either gain seven electrons or it can lose one electron. Now, as you might imagine, it would be easier to just lose one electron than to gain seven electrons. So, indeed, that is what sodium does. It tends to want to lose one electron and 
that's the case with all of the elements in group 1. So group 1 elements all tend to have the same chemical properties because they all tend to want to lose one electron. Now what happens when sodium loses one electron? Well, it has 11 protons. So protons have plus charge. And after losing an electron, it's got 2 plus 8, 10 electrons. And electrons have a minus charge. So what we see is that sodium ends up with a net positive charge of 1. Now, whenever an atom loses or gains electron, we call it an ion. So my sodium ion now has a plus charge of 1. And the way we denote that is by writing the sodium atom and then putting little plus on top. I could have put a 1 plus, but um, 1 is uh, implicit when you write plus. It's only when you get 2, 3, or more that you actually write the number there to make it explicit. So an, an ion is basically an atom that has lost or gained electrons. So we'll be seeing that name again and again since we're talking about ionic bonds now. Now let's look at another element. Let's look at chlorine this time. So chlorine, taking a look at a periodic table, we see that chlorine is element number 17. So chlorine has 17 protons, 17 electrons, and we can start filling their shells. So I'm going to need two in the bottom level, eight. 2 and 8 is 10, that leaves 7, and all 7 can go in the third shell. And indeed, as we see here, chlorine is in group number 7, so it has 7 electrons in the outer shell. So how can chlorine gain a full shell? It wants to be what we call stable, so atoms tend to want to have a stable shell of electrons. So to do that, it can either gain one electron or it can lose seven electrons. Because if it lost seven electrons, the outermost shell would be the second shell, which is already full. So it could be happy that way. Or it could gain one electron to form eight electrons in the third shell, and it'd be happy that way too. So once again, it's easier to gain less number of electrons than to lose many number of electrons. So it turns out that what chlorine tends to want to do is it tends to want to gain one electron rather than lose seven electrons. So if it were to do that, what would happen? Well, chlorine would now have an extra electron. So it has 17 protons, and the ion would now have 18 electrons. So it's left over with a minus charge of one. And we denote that by writing a minus on the top right corner of the symbol of the element to denote that it has one minus charge. Again, the one is implicit. We don't start writing numbers until we get to two or more uh, charges on the ion. So in this case, the chlorine atom has turned into a chlorine ion, and it's got an extra negative charge on it. So the next natural thing to ask is, where might chlorine gain this extra electron to complete its shell? And if sodium were to give up its electron, who might it give it to? Well, you can see here that sodium and chlorine might actually be pretty good friends, because sodium wants, wants to give one of its electron up so that it's got a full shell. And chlorine wants one electron. so. Sodium might meet chlorine and say, hey, if I were to give you one of my electrons, I'll be happy, and you'll be happy too. And indeed, that is exactly what happens when sodium meets chlorine. And in that manner, they form a bond with each other, which we'll take a look at now in more detail. So let's set our sodium and chlorine ions next to each other. I will put sodium here. It is element number 17.
Oh, I beg your pardon. Sodium is element number 11. So it's called electronic configuration 281. And chlorine is element number 17, hence electronic configuration 287. And I will now draw the electronic configuration for sodium. It's got two in the first shell. Second shell and one in the third shell. Let's use a different color for chlorine. So next I'll draw chlorine. It's got two in the first shell. Eight in the second shell. And seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven in the third shell. So sodium meets chlorine, and sodium says, Well, if only I could get rid of my one outer shell electron, I would be happy. And chlorine says, If only I could gain one electron, because then I would have eight, I would be happy. So sodium says, I will give you one of my electrons and you'll be happy and I'll be happy. So what we end up is with is a scenario where now my sodium atom having lost one electron turns into a sodium ion because Remember, the protons didn't go anywhere, so sodium still has 11 protons in its nucleus, but now it only has 10 electrons. So it's got a positive charge, we write that, and a plus. And chlorine now has an extra electron in its outer shell, so chlorine now has 2, 8, and Eight because of the extra electron it gained from sodium. So now chlorine, remember the protons didn't go anywhere. Right? The protons are still in the nucleus of the chlorine and it had 17 protons. It still has 17 protons but now it has 18 electrons because 2, 8 and 8 is going to give me 18 electrons so chlorine has a net negative charge. So where does the bonding come in? Well, sodium is positive, chlorine is negative, and um, as we may or may not know, the positive and negative charges tend to want to attract each other. So I have sodium now and chlorine, and there's this electrostatic attraction between them, so they will attract each other and it is this attraction between the ions that we call the ionic bond. So an ionic bond is actually an electrostatic attraction. Electrostatic just means elect um, attraction coming from a, a difference in charges. So there's this electrostatic attraction between sodium and chlorine. So we have now these things are ions, just let me emphasize that they're not atoms anymore because they now have an imbalance between the number of protons and number of electrons. So that takes care of the bonding part of sodium and chlorine. Well, how do they actually look like in nature? What is their structure? How do the sodium and chlorine atoms tend to arrange themselves? Well, the sodium can attract around itself many other chlorine molecules. So they might do that. And the chlorine, since it's negative, might attract around itself other sodium atoms. So this goes on and on. Uh, for a very long time until you get a really huge block um, of 
salt, for example, well, it's huge on a molecular level. There are millions and millions of atoms in them, but it could just be a grain of salt um, from where we're looking at. So this huge solid structure that we see of sodium and chlorine, where the ratio of the sodium atoms, sodium ions, I beg your pardon, to the chlorine ions is one to one because for every sodium ion that gives up its electrons, only one chlorine can claim that electron. That's why they form a ratio of one to one. And this structure we call a solid ionic lattice. And it's solid. And the bonds that are formed between the sodium and the ions in this lattice. So let's just show these bonds here, these electrostatic bonds between the ions. It's ionic because it's an electrostatic attraction. And the lattice just means a regular arrangement of you know, atoms or ions in, in a solid. So they tend to form this solid block. And you can imagine this might extend in you know, three dimensions. So we have behind this chlorine, we'll have a sodium and then a chlorine and so on and so forth. So it will, it will, it will extend until we get a relatively large ionic lattice and and that would what that, that would be what um, exists in our grain of salt so that's a um, main idea and, and just a basic overview of uh, how ionic bonds can form between substances in the next video we'll, we'll look at a couple more examples uh, of uh, of ionic bonding just so we get uh, used to this idea of uh, elements bonding together to form compounds